Okay, if you have your Bibles, please turn them to Ephesians chapter number 5, please. Ephesians chapter number 5. It's good to be gathered together here to sing praises to God and uh, listen to His Word. What a privilege it is to be gathered together like this. And, uh, and I hope here today, if you don't know the Lord as your Saviour, I hope perhaps today will be the day that you'd come to know Him <clears throat> because to know Him is to know life eternal. And there's no greater joy than to know that when you die, you're going to be with the Lord. <clears throat> there's nothing that beats that on this side of heaven. And even in <clears throat> when we get there, it's going, to, it's going to even be greater when we see Him face to face. What a blessing it is to know the Creator of the universe as your friend and Father. There's no greater thing that anyone can have. Ephesians chapter 5, <clears throat> and uh, look at verse 8 in your Bibles, please. The Bible says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Let's pray. Father in heaven, our gracious God, we do come before you, Father, this morning, and we do praise you for the privilege it is to be able to sing to you and worship you on this side of heaven. We're so thankful that you've created all things for your good pleasure. And that we, when we knew your Son as our Saviour, understood what that meant. Father, I pray that yet more and more you'll teach us, your people, the saints of God, those that have been redeemed, how to better worship you in the beauty of holiness. And Father, I pray for anybody here this morning that doesn't yet know you as their Saviour, that you'll continue to work in their hearts. I pray that you'd show them the need, uh, Lord, of your Son, that they may see their sin and how awful it is, and they'll repent and put their faith in Christ alone for their souls, for their redemption. Father, we ask and pray that you would continue to admonish your people uh, to renew their minds, that they would not only walk in love, but walk in light. Help us this morning with this message. Help me to convey it simply, plainly, dear God. Be with my speech, be with my heart and mind. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we'll look at We'll look at part two in our series, A Renewed Walk. Last week we finished part one and uh, we looked at walk in love, but this week we're going to look at walk in light. Verse eight says, For you were sometimes darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. When we think about the Christian life, we are prone to focus more on the cross of Christ uh, and on what the cross means to us in salvation and there's nothing wrong with that if it weren't for the cross of Christ none of us will be here today we'll ha we wouldn't have any hope none of us will ever have the hope of being forgiven or on their way to heaven so there's nothing wrong with focusing on our salvation uh, on Christ uh, who is our Savior however the focal point also must be on what the cross of Christ means to us after our salvation in respect to uh, while we're still living here on earth I mean, I mean if, if Christ <clears throat> gave us salvation so we can go to heaven, uh, then we'd be there already. But no, there's more to be done on this side of heaven as saved people. In other words, Christ died for our sins, but he also was raised for our justification that you and I may walk in the newness of life. So to focus more on our salvation to the neglect of our sanctification is where some Christians fall short. Remember, one of the end goals of our salvation is not what we have in Christ, it's who we are in Christ, amen? Uh, we as Christians identify ourselves with Christ, so therefore we must walk in the light, being dead to our sin. Colossians 2.6, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. From the time we trusted Christ as our Saviour, there should be a difference between the way we used to walk to the, now, to the way we now walk as Christians. And, uh, and so the whole point of this series is to cu cultivate the theme walking as a growing Christian, okay? And so in the first part of the series, we zoomed in on walking in love. We focused on imitating the love of God and the love of Christ. And this second part will labor in walking in light and the focal point being is being holy as he is holy. And uh, in our passage before us, we're going to look at four main themes. We're going to look at a sanctified walk, a submissive walk, 
a separated walk and a sobering walk. We don't have time to go all uh, through all these four. We'll focus on the first one this morning. So let's, let's look at the first, a sanctified walk. Under this point, Paul draws the contrast between those who are saints, made holy, sanctified, children of light, in comparison to those that walk in darkness and in the vanity of their minds. Have a look at Ephesians 5 verse 3, but fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you, look at this, as becometh what? Saints. So the term here Paul uses, as becometh saints, is to describe the Christian, uh, one who's trusted Christ as their saviour. And uh, what he means by this is that, you know, this ungodly behaviour that we're going to read uh, and, and labour on this morning is not fitting for a saint of God. It's not fitting for a Christian. And, uh, and so this is what he means by this. So who is, the, who is the saint then? Well, let me just say this off the cuff. A saint is not someone that does miracles. Now this is what they see in the Catholic Church. Someone that does miracles, uh, at least one miracle, they later on deem him to be a saint. Wow, no. Uh, a saint is someone that's sanctified in Christ, that's been saved by the blood of the Lamb, washed of their sin, amen? And so a saint are those who were once in darkness, but because of their faith in Christ, they've been translated into his marvelous light. And so Paul states, for you were sometimes darkness. You were sometimes darkness. So he makes it clear and known to the church of Ephesus at one point at their life, in their life, they were once living in darkness, being a slave to their sin without the light of Christ. Living in a state of sin is living in darkness. Paul doesn't say you were once in, he says you were once darkness. I mean, that just tells us the life of depravity uh, one can live, you know, searing their conscience, perhaps even getting to the point of doing things that are so depraved, you know. Uh, and let me just say, <clears throat> we're living in a very dark world. Our world is getting darker and darker by the moment. The wickedness that we see in the world today is characterized by darkness, not light. Remember what... Uh, Paul tells them in chapter number 4, in verse 17, this is, this is how we began the series in our introduction, he says this, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk, ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, how? In the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, and being alienated from the life of God. And so don't walk like the Gentiles walk, from here on start walking in the light, not in darkness. And so Paul states a similar thing in the beginning of his letter to the Ephesians. And again, we saw this in the introduction. Ephesians 2 verse 1, he says, And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we, we all had our conversation in what? In times past, this is how we used to live, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, look at this, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But now, as we're going to see this in verse 8, he says, but now ye are light in the Lord, Walk as the children of light. Look, listen, this is how you used to live. This is how you used to walk. But you being Christians, you being the saints of God, sanctified in Christ, this is how you need to walk now. You, you don't walk in darkness like you used to walk. Slave to sin, living a vain life. No, you walk in the light as Christians. Uh, it's a beautiful conjunction. But now, but now, listen, the... the, the the, the faster you realize that salvation has to do more than just go into heaven, the better it is, because salvation uh, simply encompasses sanctification. It encompasses the present time of living out our salvation, working it out to the glory of God. A lot of people want to sit on their blessed hope and, and, and say, well, I've got a ticket to heaven. Well, that doesn't give you a re uh, any reason to walk in darkness. If you have a ticket to heaven by the blood of Christ through faith, that gives you all the more reason to walk in the light, amen, as he is in the light. And, uh, and so when someone hears the message of the gospel they, and they receive Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world, they become full of light from the Lord. In verse 8 points to their positional standing 
in Christ, but we also see the command to practically walk out the light uh, that has been given to us as the children of God. So the positional is, uh, but now are ye light in the Lord. That's positional. That's who we are in the Lord uh, when we receive Christ as our, as our Savior. Uh, we've been uh, simply given light uh, from God in a very special way. Our minds are not darkened as it used to, uh, used to be. We don't have to be a slave to sin. We've been given biblical and godly sense from God. And to have the light of the Lord means we're able to see sin for what it truly is in the light of God's holiness. Amen? In the, in the light of God's righteousness and goodness found in the Word of God. Look at verse 9. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and what? And truth. A preacher once said this, Christians are not merely enlightened to God's truth, they are also filled with the light and their behavior should show it, reflecting the light of His holiness and truth. Amen? Look, listen, there are a lot of people that come under the preaching of the Word of God and the Holy Spirit conviction, they're enlightened. But the moment that you believe with the light that God has given you, you have the light in you, the light of the Lord in you by the Holy Spirit of God. Amen? So that's our position. But our practical uh, uh, walk should be in the second part of that verse. He says, but now ye are light in the Lord. Look at this. Walk as children of light. You've been given the light, use it. Walk in Christ. You've received Christ, walk ye in Him. Don't stop there. Keep going, amen? I mean, salvation should be the motivation for the way we live and walk. And again, I've said this many a time. One of my favorite verses is Romans chapter 6. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? I mean, we need to edge that in our hearts that we don't have to be a slave to sin. We can walk in the light as God has given us that light. And so the believer's standing and position has changed from darkness, sin, to light, righteousness. Therefore, sanctified Christians are to walk to resemble the position that they have in Christ. In other words, they are not to walk in darkness, but walk in the light, the light of Christ. Amen? To walk as the children of light is to walk practically in the light of Christ, but not being characterized by the list of sins given from verses 3 and 5. The list of sins are sins that are unbecoming for a child of God. And so notice what Paul states at the end of verse 3. Let it not be once named among you as becometh what? Not once. Not one time. It ought not to be named among you as become a saints. These, the list that we're going to go through, it's not proper for a sanctified child of God to live the way they used to live. It's not proper. It's out of, you know, it, 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 it's warped. It's not natural for a born-again Christian, someone that has the Spirit of God, born from uh, uh, the Spirit of God, to walk in darkness. What we have uh, in, in, in Ephesus at the time was a pagan, godless society, like our culture today. And uh, they had a temple dedicated to the Roman goddess Diana, and sexual immorality and greed was, was highly active in their day. Again, like it is today. There's no difference. As a matter of fact, our morality is getting worse. What people are doing be behind closed doors is so shameful. It's not funny. It's wicked. And by the way, I, I speak this message as a saved person, not an unsaved person. As an unsaved person, I wouldn't be, even be able to speak the things of God in a way of conviction. I used to sit in darkness, my friends. I used to live in darkness. I was darkness. If I had told you in detail the way I used to live, think, the way, what I used to say, you wouldn't believe me as a saved man today, 21 years later. Like I said in last week's message, you'd think I had a twin. But that's the miracle work of God that God wants to do in every single soul. He wants to make you a new creature where old things pa pass away and behold, all things become new. And that can only happen in Christ Jesus. So notice how Paul now spells out this, the, 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 the list of this ungodly, godless characteristic that's not, that's not becoming, of a, 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 or it's unbecoming for a child of God. Okay, Number one. In verse 3, but fornication. Don't let fornication be once named among you. 
What's fornication? Well, it, it, it's this. Sexual immorality or sexual activity outside a marriage covenant. It is unlawful sexual, sexual acts outside, the, outside of the sa sacred sanction of marriage. That's what it is. Uh, you, you will say, well, that's a bit old-fashioned, isn't it? To get married and then to, to have a special sexual relationship. Well, it's old as the Bible. Amen. It, it is old as God's Word. That's why our society is the mess, because they put the light of God's word aside, they live in darkness, and they get depressed, they want to kill themselves, they get diseases and all the rest of it. Why? It's because they're living in darkness, they live in sin. Look, there are a lot of people, that even outside of Christ, they'll say, I'll never have sex outside of marriage, and did it. I was one of them. I had some morals, and I submit to you like uh, uh, this, many people won't because they don't find the opportunity, but had the opportunity come to them, I guarantee you there are many, many people that would jump to it. This is the dark society that we live in today. Fornication. Flaunting it. And this also includes, I would say to you this, uh, it also includes harlotry, homosexuality, bestiality, and pornography. And you say, well, why does it include pornography? You're not committing the act, it's in the mind. Yeah, well, that's where it begins. That's where, it, by the way, that's where it begins to fester and that's where it's going to lead. It is God's will that uh, he will have one man, one woman to get married before having any kind of physical relation uh, uh, with, uh, with the opposite sex. Look at this, First, Th First Thessalonians 4. For this is the will of God, even what? Even your sanctification that you abstain from okay so one of the things that's going to help you walk in the light and grow as a christian if you uh, reject any sexual form of immorality now do you desire to be renewed and and god do a work in you and through you to make you a blessing then you have to flee these wicked things look what first corinthians six eighteen says flee fornication every sin that a man doeth is without the body but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body what know ye not that your body is the temple of the holy ghost which is in you which you have of god and you are not your own for you're bought with a price therefore glorify god in your body and in your spirit which are what god you want to glorify god keep yourself to marriage find a good godly man or a good godly woman and marry them and then you can continue to have god's blessed plan in a marriage covenant but if it's outside of a marriage covenant it's sin. It's darkness. Who said, who said that? Well, God said that. That's what I hear on the street all the time. Oh, who said you can't have sex outside of marriage? Well, God said it. The God of light. In him there's no darkness. Again, the reason why this world is a mess, because they reject the light of God's word. And then they want to blame it on God himself. Isn't that a shame? Look, this is a warning to us. If you struggle with watching any wicked films, any wicked movies, that includes any Hollywood movie that has soft porn in it, I tell you this, I guarantee you, you will carry it in, before you're married, you will carry it into your marriage covenant and it will destroy your marriage. If you can't, as a Christian, right now say, I'm done with that filth, I do not even want to look at that filthy commercial. We even have filthy commercials now. I don't even want to set my eyes upon those wicked, dark things. I want to be pure in my mind and in my practice. And if you don't have that walking in the light and you're not resolved and you don't say, I don't want to be like those Gentiles walking in the vanity of their minds, I guarantee you, you will carry it in your marriage and your marriage will be destroyed because of that. I had a man a couple of days ago reach out to me. He's a man that you know, basically was asking questions about theological questions, eschatology and so forth. We went back and forth a little and uh, spoke, on the, spoke on the phone with him a couple of months ago. Anyway, he reached out and, uh, and he, said to him, he said to me, please brother, pray for me. I believe God is chastening me. So, you know, I thought the best thing to do is to call him, see where he's at. Someone that, you know, basically says that to you, you know that they're struggling or there's a reason why God's chastening them. So I called him up, I said, look, what's the problem? And he began to express how he wanted God's best for him. I said, that's good, brother. He wanted a, you know, God to lead him on a good godly woman. That's good. Uh, but, you know, how, uh, but I said, how is God chasing you? 
And he said, oh, I'm not feeling well. I think I have you know, something in my stomach and it might be starting with C, ending with R. Didn't even want to say the word. I said, oh, brother. Yeah. Well, I know God allows things for a purpose. I said, Can, have you been dabbling with sin? He said, yes. I said, have you been dabbling with pornography? And he said, yes. I said, brother, if God is chasing you, and if that is of God, that's a wicked act. That's wickedness, folks. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care if, you know, some pastor across the country that says, oh, we all struggle with it, it's normal. No, it's not normal for a Christian. It's unbecoming of a saint of God to watch that filth. It's filthy. It suppresses the power of God and the Spirit of God in your life. It hinders your relationship with God and others. And I began to say, I said, brother, you need to put on your running shoes and you need to be a Joseph and say, how can I commit this great wickedness and sin against God? And it ought to be that. You know what? Our motives ought to be that. Not to say, you know what? I want to walk in the light so God can bless me with a good marriage and God can bless me with a good job. God can bless me with a good ministry. Although that's good. But you know what? That shouldn't be the main goal. The main goal is this. I do not want to grieve the heart of God. I said, brother, you need to get off the phone right now and get right with God. You need to lift your hands up and tell him how disgraceful you've been and how wicked you're doubling in these things. Get off the phone and stop talking to me and get right with God. And so he got off the phone. Moments later, he reached out to me. He said, thank you for that. I've been right with, I got right with God. I feel relief. I spoke to him this morning so I could use the message. I said, look, this is his testimony in the message. I said, I'm not going to mention your name, but I know it's going to encourage a whole heap of people. I won't mention it. Can I use it? He said, absolutely. He said, we need more pastors that will rebuke us than to comfort us in our sin. He said something along those lines. He says, too many pastors do not rebuke. And you know what? When you rebuke some people, you get in trouble. But when you rebuke people like this, they'll love you for it. He said, he has a heart for God. He fell. Get up, son. Get up. Stop walking in darkness. This is what Paul is simply saying. Hey, listen. Hey, henceforth, don't be like those Gentiles. You know how many things you carry into your salvation from the old life that you need to stay putting off and putting on? Some things stick with you. You know what he said? To, he said this. He said, look, I've dabbled this before I was saved and I thought I thought I'll never, ever as a Christian be struggling with it. And he quoted that verse to me. He quoted it. Take heed lest ye fall. He quoted it. He said, but you know what now? He says, my relationship with God is intimate now. He said, before that, it wasn't intimate. I said, yeah, that will do it to you. You start reading your Bible as a chore, going through the motions, praying like a chore. Why? Because there's a guilty conscience. And he, says, oh, and he said to me, I don't know if I've got that you know, cancer disease or not. I, I think I'm feeling better. <laughs> okay, well, maybe it was just a heart that was grieved, burdened down. But you know what? I thank God, if it was the chastening of God, but it got him so far to confess his sin to me and God using a Nathan in his life to say, get it right, son. And he took it well. But listen, if you're dabbling in immorality today, stop it. Stop it. You know how accessible the internet is? We're, we're talking about 25, 30 years ago, we used to have cassette tapes, and it was very hard for someone to get their hands on filthy videos. Very difficult. Right now it's not. You're sitting in your bedroom and one click leads to another and you're watching that filth and you're actually putting images in your mind that will haunt you. That will haunt you. You need to stop it. You need to repent and get right. Because I, I, I say, the next one here is, is all uncleanness. Doesn't it say that? Back, back uh, if we go to you know, our main passage, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3. What does it say? But fornication and what? All uncleanness. These are associated. Unclean. What's that mean? Dirty. Disgusting. Dirty things that are abhorred. It's unclean. 
I mean, I can, and one day I probably will preach a whole sermon about abstain, abstaining, getting victory over the, 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 you know, these things. But you know what? Even the industry of, of, of this, these films, do you understand what they put these ladies through? Do you understand that most of them are drugged? They're hurt? And you're actually contributing to that filth? It's, 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 it's unclean, it's disgusting, dirty. That's what it is. And you're contributing it. You're encouraging it. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, For God hath not called us unto what? Uncleanness, but unto what? Holiness. God wants us to be sanctified and holy, not only in our position, but also in our practice. So living, in a, living a, a life of immorality and having our mind bombarded with wicked things that we see is not going to be any good for you, for your children, for your family, and for this church. I'm telling you right now. As a matter of fact, it needs to be dealt with promptly. Promptly means quickly, without any delay, because it's unclean. And then the next one we have here is covetousness. It's again, it's a, 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 again a form of greed, lust, desire. Uh, this has to have a has to do with a strong desire or lustful passion for something that is forbidden. Period. Think about Lucifer when he desired to take the place of God in heaven. Uh, think about Eve when she desired to take from the forbidden fruit. Think about the children of Israel uh, in the wilderness when they lusted after the food in Egypt. Uh, think about Achan when he desired to take from that forbidden uh, thing, the things of Jericho. Think of Demas when he chose worldly pleasures over the things of God. Think about Judas when he betrayed Christ for a lousy 30 pieces of silver. That's what covetous is. It's greed. It's, it's wanting to consume it upon your own lust. I mean, uh, this is not only referring to the lust of money and possession, but it also refers to sexual and sensual desires. It refers to anything that is forbidden outside of a marriage covenant. Think about David when he desired another man's wife. Uh, again, another form of covetousness is something that is good, but not God's will for you. Think about King Saul when he desired and took the cattle of the Amalekites, when God says, no, destroy them, I don't want them. But King Saul saw, oh, it was a good thing, if I kept them, I can sacrifice them to you. No, I don't want you to do that. But really what uh, King Saul wanted, he's cons consumed it upon his own lust. Now, the question is, do you know what all these things have in common? They all have consequences. Every one of them. I mean, if you just look at the book of James, James chapter 1, when, see, when sin has conceived, it bringeth forth what? And so Lucifer was kicked out of heaven. Eve was kicked out of the garden, lost her sweet fellowship with God. Uh, the children of Israel were, in the, were destroyed in the wilderness. Listen, Achan lost his life and his family. Uh, Demas lost his ministry and he was replaced by John Mark. Judas lost his life. He committed suicide and hung himself. Uh, King David lost his child. And was, listen, his family was never the same after that. King Saul lost his throne. Listen, there's a consequences for coveting. There's a consequences for desiring the very things that is forbidden. There are things that are forbidden that God doesn't want for you, that he wants for someone else. But don't even lust after those things. You know what? You'll be destroyed. Oh, how come God gives that to them? He doesn't give that to me. That's covetousness. That's not being content with what God has given you. In verse 5 we see that covetousness is a form of idolatry. For this you know that not whoremonger or unclean person, nor look at this, nor covetous man who is a what? Idolater. You know what the first commandment is? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. You know what the last commandment is of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not covet. What does that tell us? Covetousness is self-worship. It's being a God. That's why I idolatry anything that's before God. I don't want God's will, I want my will. That's covetousness. But notice verse 4. He goes and says, neither filthiness. 
Now, what's that? Again, it's associated with the first. Uh, sexual immorality, things that cause shame, things that can be offence, things that are rude, obnoxious, uh, things that are practised uh, for the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. It's filthy. Uh, again, I'm not going to labour on this, but it coincides with uncleanness and anything that is uh, immoral. And then it goes on to say, nor foolish talking. What's that? Silly talk, talking nonsense. Things that might, uh, w uh, might be said without thinking. Th uh, carnal speech, idle talk. Things that are said without any kind of discretion. In other words, things that are said that do not build up. They it's corrupt communication. It, go it goes hand in hand with jesting. Foolish talking and jesting, which is not convenient, Paul says. What's jesting? What's silly, rude jokes? Joking about sexual things? Joking about sin? I mean, again, this only helps make sin light in your life. When you joke around about sin, you're only undermining sin in your life. Instead of having a broken disposition, people jest about it. They laugh about it. Oh yeah, everyone does it. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's under the blood, man. You know, when we're talking about sin, the Bible very specifically tells us to have a sober mind about it. You remember it was sin that put Jesus on the cross. There's no laughing matter there, is it? But sometimes there will be people that make a joke out of it. Even preachers from the pulpit will perhaps accidentally laugh about it. But listen, uh, we ought not to feel comfort in our sin when we're in church or even outside of the church when the Word of God is preached. You know why there are mega churches in our world today? Because the preacher doesn't preach on sin. He downplays sin. He preaches on things that will be exciting and tickling to the ear, things that you want to hear. I mean, right now, I don't know about you, but there's a bit of uncomfortableness taking place in your heart. <laughs> and you might even be on it. You say, well, Charlie, I don't even watch that. I I'm right with God. I hate the filthy things that I see. Good on you. Praise God. But even then, when you are walking upright, there's still a sense of, man, this, there's authority behind what he's saying. It's from God. There's something still. It's like as if I've committed something. I need a search. Did I do? Did I, did, that's good. That's a good thing to have. But there ought to be a holy hush in your life. And when you downplay it, and by, by silly jokes, you damper what the Holy Spirit wants to do with exposing your sin by His light that is in you. Bad, rude, crude sense of humor. By the way, there's a difference between good sense of humor and bad sense of humor. So how do I know the difference? Walk in the Spirit, and when the Spirit of God is quenched or, or grieved in your life, you would know. Some people are far from knowing because they haven't been walking in the Spirit for so, for so long that it's become a custom for them to, to tell rude and crude jokes and to downplay sin in their life. Someone once said this, the gift of wit is a blessing, but when it is uh, attached to a filthy mind or a base motive, it becomes a curse. It's good to be witty, on it, sharp, but someone can turn that into something that is horrible you could talk about a serious matter someone says something downplays it and makes a joke about it makes light of the matter that's jesting by the way this can happen when we dwell upon our past lifestyle when we're giving our testimony there's a difference between sharing our testimony so we can show people the grace of god how we've been saved from our sin and there's a difference between glorifying your sin when you give it ephesians 5 verse 12 says for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done in them in what? It's a shame. I tell people, you know, you don't want to know what I've done in the dark place in my old life before I was a Christian. Oh, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. And when they do that, I say, I'm not telling you. I tell some people in the proper place for a proper purpose with a proper motive, but I'm not telling you. you, you, you wanna, and, and sometimes I tell people and they go, hey, hey, hey. Like, whoa! They absolutely, they get thrilled when you tell them about the wickedness that they've done, I've done, and they get thrilled, like, ah, they get excited, like their eyes open, instead of being broken. 
It's been said that foolish talking and jesting is literally an easy turn of speech. In the context, the idea is of, of the one who can turn every conversation into a joking comment on sexual matters, usually with a double meaning. So in other words, it's, just, it's got one meaning, but they've turned it around to make it sound like it means something else in a very crude way. It's wrong. It's jesting. I was talking with a man yesterday and telling him about the gospel and I was telling him how he can be saved from his sin by the blood of Christ. He jumped up and, and, and just as soon as I finished, he says, no, I don't commit sin, I make sin. In other words, he's the inventor of it. And his wife harked up and laughed as soon as he said it. And I looked at her and looked at him and just shook my head and they, they went off. I mean, do you know what the wisdom of God thinks about things like this? Have a look. Fools make a mock at what? They make a mock at sin. But, the right, but among the righteous there is what? Favour. You know who God favours? Those that are broken over their sin. Not make a mock over sin, not downplay sin in their life. Those that are broken over it. God gives grace to who? The humble. He resists the proud. Now, if you notice, foolish talking and jesting would be condemned in the same category of the sins of fornication, filthiness and uncleanness. And you may say, why? Well, I say, I believe, it, I believe in this sense because it has great potential to grieve the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is what? Good to the use of what? Edifying, building up, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. A bad sense of humor and hyper, uh, you know, jesting and being a hyper larrikin is not going to be helpful or building up anybody. And verse 30, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. So what happens when you're not walking in the Spirit? Because foolish talking and jesting grieves the Spirit of God. And what happens when you're not walking in the Spirit? Well, you're not walking in light. You're walking in what? In the flesh. And you're not going to produce the fruit that is found in verse 9. The fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Notice the last part of verse 4. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not what? Convenient. Which are not convenient. Again, it's not fitting for a saint of God. It's not proper. Listen, it is out of place for a Christian to speak like that. It is out of place. Rude and crude, obnoxious, foolish and unsense, uh, 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 without any sense, not sober-minded. Remember what Paul told Tim, Titus, that his words, hey, listen, let the young men be sober. Let them have sound speech that cannot be condemned. So easy to fall into it. We say silly things at times, but it ought not to be becoming of a saint of God. It's unbecoming. It's not fitting. It's not proper. But he says, but rather giving of thanks. Now that's proper. Having an attitude of gratitude, amen? <laughs> amen? An attitude of gr gratitude. Instead of talking about things that are vain, filthy, dirty, use your tongue to worship God. I mean, how many times I tell people, uh, you, know, when, you know, that use God's name in vain. They use God's name in vain. Again, a lady said it two days ago. She said, Jesus' name in vain. I said, that's my saviour. You know how many times people say, oh my, you know, God, and they use it in vain? I say, you know what? You can say, oh my God, how I love you, instead of using it like a curse word. People just say it like that. Some Christians fall into it. They carry it out from their bad lifestyle and they keep saying it. Oh my, oh my, oh my. Oh, time and time again, they don't pick up on it. Instead of talking about the things that are vain, worthless, have no profit, use your tongue to thank God for his goodness. Use your tongue to thank God for his righteousness, for what he's done in your life. You know, you turn in wit the conversation that is not right into a good thing. Yeah, you turn it. Because later on we're going to see in another sermon that we, that we walk uh, a separated walk. Because the Bible says, hey, listen, don't, don't hang around these kind of people. Don't be partnership or fellowship with them. 
but rather what? Reprove them. And that's not a popular thing today, is it? I mean, who wants to have that kind of uh, reputation when they're amongst people? Or he is that man that always tells us uh, not to talk about rude things and not to say this or say that. And when they're around you, they're like, shh, we've got to watch our mouth. <laughs> well, and you know what the sad thing is? It's, it's, it's from carnal Christians that say it, not from the world. From carnal Christians. Carnal Christians have to watch their mouth around you. Thinking, whoa, whoa what's taking place here today? Well, that's how the, the world is becoming. This is the modern Christianity, my friends. Modern Christianity. I was talking to a guy on the street last week. And uh, it's on, I, I decided, I was actually witnessing to him way before I actually had it on camera. I wanted to get him on camera so I can show Christendom that this is your common denominator in, in Christianity today. This man believes that he can swear a little and sin a lot and he's still going to heaven and he's still right with God. I said, you're deceived as we're going to see in a moment. For, you know, in verse 5 he says, for this ye know that no whoremonger, no unclean person, the Bible says, would inherit in the kingdom of, of Christ and of God. You're deceived. Having that kind of attitude is wrong, isn't it? I mean, it's the attitude that's, that's wrong. We know as Christians what we can still fall into sin, but having an attitude saying, well, I'm going to still live in sin and I'm still going to heaven, that's when it's wrong. So God wants us to do what? He wants, he says this, so let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and what? And what? Glorify your Father which is in heaven. And part of our light shining is not how we just live, but what we say. We esteem God among men. We uplift God. We worship God. That's who we are. We worship God. We, we're righteous, upright people. We don't laugh at crude and rude jokes. We turn them around, we walk away, we do something to shed light on the matter so people can be helped. Not so we can be a Pharisee and say, well, I'm better than that person, but no, rather that I'm uh, shining for the glory of God that they too may be affected by my presence. That they'll see and understand what's the difference between that which is good and that which is bad. A preacher once said, that, as people who have light from the Lord, our actions should reflect our faith. We should live above reproach morally so that we will reflect God's goodness to others. Now in closing, I want you to notice verse 5 as Paul puts them into remembrance. He says, For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. So this is, a, this is almost like common knowledge amongst the Ephesians. So they, they, they basically would have had some sort of teaching. Uh, these kinds of people who live like they are not born again will never ever see the kingdom of God. Notice how he says, for this you know. The church had been taught at one point this truth that you cannot be characterized as a fornicator, as an unclean person, someone that is filthy, rude and crude in your speech and actions, and expect to go to heaven. You can't. I mean, again, the Bible's very clear. How can someone claim to have fellowship with God and they walk with darkness? You lie and you do not the truth. Again, we're talking about someone's attitude and someone's life. Okay, we're not talking about someone that falls and, and is being sanctified and God's working on. We're talking about someone's whole lifestyle. Someone that is a hypocrite. They're one way in the church and one way out there. I mean, they don't even want and care about the things of God. They're just in church because they have to go. They're in church because they're obliged to go. They want to soothe their conscience. They don't care about the things of God. They're just, it's showy. They don't care about God. They don't care about the things of God. All they care is about themselves and their lifestyle. As a matter of fact, some people go to church for other motives. So I want to challenge you this morning, and I want you to be honest, and don't say it verbally or out loud, but in your heart. Why are you here today? Are you here because you love the Lord? 
Are you here because you really want to worship God? Heed His Word so you can grow and walk in the light? Or are you here because you have to be here and you don't care about God? And as a matter of fact, later on in the day, you'll go in that little room, get back on your phone and watch ah, the filthy stuff. Because I know if the Christian does that, there's something going on. There's a war and conflict in his heart. He's in turmoil. He cannot enjoy that filth, although he somehow has fallen into it and been addicted by it, and, and, and people can, but he pulls back or he has the chastening of God in his life. We see that very clearly. But they have a heart for God, they love God, but they've fallen. They, they, something has taken place in their life that they're not where they're supposed to be. Get right, Christian, get right. But there are people that do not have that tension in their life at all. They freeze, they, they sin freely, and they don't have any conviction over that. They have no love for God. They don't have no love for, they're not, they don't have no light in them. Their, their mind is completely darkened. And so, if that's you today, I want to encourage you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal saviour. Because he wants to save you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to give you eternal life. He wants to put that Holy Spirit of God in you, which is his character, and give you the light of Christ so you can walk in victory, so you can have the power to say no to sin. And when you fall, you can get up by the grace of God and with the help of God and by his word and by his spirit and say, God, forgive me. Because if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But is there broken disposition, a heart that wants to know God on an intimate level and knows how disgusting that sin is? I want to encourage you to repent, turn to God, and trust Jesus Christ as your Savior once and for all. And you say, well, what if I don't do that? Well, the Bible says here, there's no way you're going to enter into the kingdom of, of, of Christ or of God. You're not going to go to heaven when you die. Or what's the, what's the alternative? You're going to go to hell. And you're going to, be, you're going to burn forever. The Bible describes hell to be a place of torment, weeping, gnashing of teeth, a place of darkness, a place where the Bible says that the smoke of their torment will come and ascend and the will send, uh, ascend every day and forever. And you don't want to reject God. You don't want to reject Jesus Christ as your Savior for what? For a life of sin? It's disgusting. You want to be a statistic like the world and live in depression? Hurt? People, hurting people, hurt people, have no direction. You want to you live a life that is not victorious, down in the dumps, taking advantage of Satan, and let Satan continue to ruin you, and, and, and maybe then one day you'll end up where he is? Because he knows he only has a little time to take as many as he can with him to hell. You want to be one of those people? Come on. You don't. Then, then get saved and let God work in you and make you a godly person. Give you a desire for the things of God. Walk in light. Put off and put on. It's a wonderful thing. It's like Paul saying to these people, you know the life that you were saved out of? That's when he says, don't you know and understand that it's these people that will never go to heaven, they're going to die. You know that life. Come on. People who indulge in sin and take pleasure in it will never have a place in the kingdom of God. Don't walk like that. Don't walk like them. Now, walk in the light. You're the children of light. Walk in the light. Now, I want to clear some things up. And I want to make it clear that what these points... These wicked acts done in dark places and dark out of dark practices, it's not for the purpose to become saints. I don't, I don't stop fornicating to become a saint. Right? 
I don't stop telling rude jokes or jests to become a Christian. I become a Christian by receiving Jesus Christ as my personal saviour for my sin and then God, through his word and by his spirit, helps me not to fornicate, helps me not to tell rude jokes, helps me to to walk in the light. Because you can say to yourself right now, man, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna wait for marriage. I, I messed up, but I'm gonna wait for marriage. That's not gonna take you to heaven. That's a good thing, but you're not gonna get to heaven by that action. You have gotta get saved. Why? Because you've already committed the act. You've got so much debt. And God wants to wash your sins away, and then he wants to help you set your foot upon a rock and establish your goings. I just wanna, I just wanna make that clear. <clears throat> you're a saint by receiving Christ as your saviour and then when you receive him as your saviour you'll start living a life that is sanctified, amen and I want to say this, not only as individuals but as a church collectively because he goes on to say let it not be once named what? among you you say the pastor's role as an old overseer, the elder's role ever, as an old overseer is to know the state of the flock and to help them be where God wants them to be. He's not an underseer. In other words, he doesn't turn a blind eye when someone's fallen in the sin. He helps them get up by the grace of God. We, you know, to comfort someone in their sin is not really being a pastor, it's not being an overseer, it's not someone that watches for someone's soul. And God's put brothers and sisters in the church to encourage you, listen, not to intimidate you. And I know that there are some people in churches, they're Pharisees, I understand that. But there are some people in church that genuinely love you and want you to get victory over your sin and walk a victorious life. But that's going to take some rebuke at times, not just encouragement. And a lot of people don't want to be rebuked, they cry like a baby. And they start twisting words. That's wrong. So as a church, not just personally, God wants us to shine as as the light of the world. You know, Jesus says, yeah, the light of the world. I'm the light of the world. But he says now that, yeah, the light of the world. You're supposed to reflect the great light, which is Christ. As a church, not only individually. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and we're finished. He says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Look at this. A holy nation. Who's he talking about? He's talking about a church made up of Jews and Gentiles. You read the whole passage. A peculiar people. That he should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into what? Into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people. But now the people of God which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Listen, dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from what? Fleshly lust, which war against the soul. And it's individuals that make up a church. The, the building here, this, this, is, this is a building. It's not the church. You are the church. And to be in the church or to be a saint is to receive Jesus Christ as your saviour and let God have his way with you. Amen? Let God work in you and through you for his glory and good pleasure to show forth his praises. God doesn't want you to live a defeated life, sit at home and sulk and cry and have pity and poor me. God wants you to walk up and sober and be a man. Quit you like men. Be a man. Stop being kids. Be a man and be controlled and be disciplined and let God work the way Christians live today. It's like God is powerless. No, he's not powerless. God is able. He's able to give you a a, a backbone that is strong in the Lord, not, not a backbone that's like a spaghetti noodle with your head down and defeated because you're watching the filth over there and you're dabbling with sin over here and you have a guilty conscience and all you can do is blame the one that's trying to help you. That's not of God. That's what the Corinthians did to Paul. That's what, that's what the Galatians did to Paul. Paul says, the more I love you, the less I be loved. Why? Because I corrected you and I want you to live holy and I want you to have God's best for your life. 
I don't know about you, but I don't want to be in a church that knows how to tickle ears in a very professional way. You read your Bible. If you read your Bible cover to cover, you would notice that it's full of correction, reproof and correction. And God's wisdom says it is the way of life. Don't get sick of it. Despise not prophesying. Because it's the only thing that's going to keep you on the straight and narrow and get you to walk in the way that God wants you to walk in step with the Holy Spirit, looking like the Lord, growing in Christ for the glory of God. And that's what you want to aim for. Amen. A sanctified life, not only positionally but practically. Being a holy man of God and a holy man of woman for the glory of God on this side of heaven. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.